the question is, do I do I need a break job or how much? Well, the first the first question is, well, do you really need a break job or the brake squeaking or did somebody tell you you need brakes and um, you know, is there a symptom? Is there a vibration? And we can talk about you know a lot of these things, but then you know you have to wonder. There's a lot of marketing out there. Fifty nine dollar lifetime brake job. Ninety nine dollars hmm. all four wheels or something like that. How can they guarantee a friction item for? For life. Life. Doesn't make sense to me. But I, I have heard four brakes for, you know, all four wheels for $99, but then they're pro rata. I don't know what pro rata means, it's but. Somehow pro rated. Plan words. I, I, um, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's marketing. It's just like your your new BMW or your new General Motors vehicle. You don't have to change the spark plug to 100,000 miles. You only change the oil every 15,000 miles. That's marketing. And it's the same thing with these $99 break job marketing or, or 59 or whatever. But the, one of the questions is, how can you guarantee a brake pad for life? Well, you can't. I guess you can. Anybody can guarantee anything. But it's designed to wear out. It is supposed to wear out. So really, that's a marketing ploy to get you to come back in to buy the rest of the stuff every time that, in my opinion, you may or may not need. You just get because... You can't replace $59 brake jobs forever for free. Right. It just doesn't make sense. Well, when I was talking to Joel about this topic, we were talking about, well, an Asian import is completely different than the way you would handle a brake job on a European import. It's true. Uh, and it comes down to one of the big components that gets replaced on a European import is the brake rotors. They get replaced pretty much every time you do a brake job. Never do you turn them. They're a lot softer compound of metal or, you know, the metallurgy is different. Uh, so you get uh, new the, rotors. The addition, well, the the reason we don't turn them is they they're very soft. They're perf- you know all those cars are very performance oriented, so the the materials are going to be a little softer. They want to build heat in them faster, and they're just going to wear. Part of that is of getting good brake performance is they're going to wear wear faster. So you typically don't want to machine them because they're not going to make it. They're going to have a big, you know, be dished out. And Well, then on a European import, the symptoms for when you need brakes is different than on an Asian import. So on a European import, they have sensors on the brake pads. As of the pad wear, the sensor contacts the rotor and grounds the circuit and turns on a light. Yeah, well, and let's back it up just a little bit, Dave. First off, we talked about do I need a brake job and how much should a brake job cost? There's not one size that fits all. Pretty typical if you wanted to say the average popular uh, popular import and American car on the road are pretty typical. And I'm going to say most shops are going to be between somewhere between $250 and $350. That's for a front brake job. I would say any, any, you know, front or rear axle, typical turn the rotor type brakes. And put new brake pads in there. Yeah, we don't turn them. We machine them. Oh, right? so you know, here's my play on words. Semantics, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you turn it. Well, you want to you know, be the sign turner on the corner and call it a good rotor? Yeah, I worked but, that job. I was but, young. I needed the money. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the symptoms before you even need to get into a brake job, the, the easiest symptom for most everybody to hear and, and see, uh, there I go, see a symptom, but with the radio turned down, I hear it all the time. Cars just driving by, <laughs> You don't have your foot on the brakes. You're thinking, well, it can't be my brakes. I don't have my feet on the brakes. You step on the brakes, and the noise goes away a lot. That's a typical symptom of there's a warning sensor. That's it's a little soft metal tab attached to the brake pad, and it contacts the rotor and starts making as, noise. Yeah, as the pads wear down and deplete, then that sensor is going to drag when you're going. How much material would you say is left? By the time you get to there. Looks like you forgot to turn off your cell phone, huh, Dave? Got a text message. You just wait till the end of the show, buddy. <laughs> So with, um, we're going to measure brake pads thicknesses in millimeters or 30 seconds of an inch. I'm not a big fan of someone saying, oh, there's 20% left because that's objective or subjective. Measurement is not. If it's 3 30 seconds of an inch, it's 3 30 seconds of an inch. So, and, and that's typically 2 to 3 30 seconds or about 2 and a half or 3 millimeters is when those sensors are going to start touching and dragging. Or in the European case, in some late model American cars, they have a sensor like the BMWs and stuff that drags and then grounds out and causes the light to come on. So that's one of your symptoms. Well, I, as a consumer, I've seen this. Well, is it 2.30 seconds to the indicator? Is it 2.30 seconds on one side, on both sides? Wh- wh- where's the uh, 2.30 seconds, that number you're coming up with? Is that from the contact of metal to metal, where the rotor's touching the backing metal of the when pad? the sensor starts to drag, that's 2.30 seconds of an inch. So you still got 2.30 seconds of material, but then you're into 
you're into the meat. You're into the rotors and you're into dollars right. when you've gone that far typically. So you're easily, easily adding, you know, maybe 50 bucks a wheel to put a rotor on. Uh, if you, 100 bucks. 100, 100 bucks a, wheel. a rotor usually. I mean, now give or take a, a little anything 88 Nissan Sentry, you can buy that rotor for $20. But we can, we're talking quality now. You can buy that another rotor for a Nissan Sentra for $76. And there's a big difference besides 50 bucks. It's the quality, the manufacturing process, the amount of carbon in the steel. There's a lot that goes into it. And I always have the hamburger analogy. You can go to McDonald's and get a 99-cent one. Maybe go to Carl's Jr. and get the $6 burger or Fuddruckers. Or even Durant's has a great burger. It's 13 bucks though. <laughs> but, and then somebody might say, oh, gosh, that's expensive for a hamburger. Well, it is, but it's better. Well, so. on rotors, I think you can really go wrong. I've seen some really inexpensive ten and twenty dollar rotors, and the metallurgy is totally different. I mean, these things there's a certain hardness that needs to be there. There's a balance to it. It can't have you know thin spots on this end. You can have a you know vibration from a rotor that is not balanced. So, yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's all kinds, and there's some other symptoms we need to talk about besides just the 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 noise, maybe your parking brake, you grab that thing and it's going through the roof. That's a good sign that the rear brakes are out of adjustment. If the rear brakes are out of adjustment, well, the fronts aren't going to last as long. So that's just another symptom that maybe there's something that your vehicle needs some attention in the brake category. Let's go with, uh, looks like Bill on a mobile home. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Oh, we're going to the phones already, Dave. <laughs> yes, All right. Are. I thought uh, we were going to talk brakes. Bill, what can we help you with today? Hi, Dave. Uh, yeah, I have a, a 98 Winnebago, Winnebago motorhome. It's on a uh, Chevy E-Series chassis with a Triton V10 engine. And uh, uh, I was up in the uh, the mountains, came back down yesterday, and, and this problem has happened to me before. Uh, a, a, a real big loss of power. Uh, on the grades after, you know, having driven for an hour or so. Um, what happens, uh, getting on a grade, I start losing it, uh, give it full throttle, and it starts flattening out. If I come back to about half throttle, uh, I'm getting power, but I'm dropping way down on my speed on the grades. Um, I had it checked out once before. They thought it might have been the catalyst converter being loaded up. Uh, they checked it and it was okay. And uh, also my my check engine light has come on, and I'm at a loss as to what's creating that problem. Well, I would say I would bet that the, with the check engine light coming on, that's going to leave some sort of clue, I would, I would certainly hope. And the other question I would have, when when you're losing the power, how is the engine cooling and the air conditioning? Does it sound like maybe the fan clutch is engaging and moving a lot of air, like a really heavy uh, whirl coming uh, through? No problem. I, I get no temperature rise on the engine, um, and uh, the, the engine is properly lubricated, so uh, I, 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 I don't think that's my problem. Well, the first thing that did come to mind was a catalytic converter, but now that we got a check engine light, that's a great start. So we're going to go on to get that computer scanned and find out. That'll be a fingerprint of where to start and what the problem may be. Right. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking fan clutch or something like that. I don't know that it's necessarily robbing, you know, if it's really losing power, maybe it's not in the right gear. And, you know, that's hard to say. And I see you're in Mesa and a great shop to fix that is one of the bumper to bumper shops, ADS, Automotive Diagnostic Specialties. They have a dyno in their shop. So what they're going to be able to do they're going to put that car in the dyno or the motorhome, and they're going to run it. And they can simulate pulling Sunset Point. They can simulate going wherever you want to go. They can simulate having a 20,000-pound trailer behind that thing and get it to act up live. You don't have to go out and test drive. So give ADS a shot, and I know they can, they can handle it. Well, thanks so much for the call, Bill. Let's go with Mike in Tempe on a 2001 Honda Civic. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, uh, on my uh, Civic, um, the last time I took it in to the Honda dealer, I was told that uh, the shocks were uh, leaking and they wanted to replace them. Now, the vehicle has um, definitely under 50,000 miles on it, and other vehicles I've had, I mean, I've gone quite a few miles more than that before I've had any issues with the shocks, shocks or struts. Did they show you the leak? 
No. Okay. Dave and I have had this conversation before, you know, about leaks that you won't see. And it's not uncommon for shocks or struts to be leaking a little bit. Okay. Um, 50,000 miles? Not a lot. Mm, I I think uh, I always have to bite my tongue, Dave. (laughs) It's starting to hurt doing it. But I think that perhaps um, it might have been a slow day in the dealership that day. Um, Now, that being said, the car is 10 years old, 11 years old. If you look at the manufacturers like KYB or Monroe, they're going to say struts should be replaced and shocks at 75,000 miles. That's probably a good time to start thinking about it. But that's one of those things. A strut is never going to leave you on the side of the road, never going to leave you broken down. It's, It's a comfort item. You get really, really bad. It could be a safety item. You can take a car with completely worn out struts and a car with new struts, and the braking distance will be improved. It will stop better. It will handle better. So you could make that argument, but typically don't fall into that trap. Well, I would, you know, are you having a ride issue? I would like to see the leak. I mean, if one's blown out completely and it's leaking real bad, severe leak, I mean, it's you're going to have some ride issue. You're going to feel that, I would think. Or a tire. But if it's seeping or it's a little wet around the seal, I don't know if I'm going to get too upset. It's not not gonna, at 50,000. Not going to ra- write home about it. And maybe at 80,000, or maybe when you're recovered from doing your 90,000 mile service, then it's time to do the struts. And I'll tell you, Dave, there's one thing that we see a lot too, and it's the body shop. The car's in an accident, and they put one new strut on. Mm. And I asked the body shop guys, come on, why, why don't you call them and say, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Whatever, we should really put two struts on here. The insurance is going to pay for one, but let's put another one on so at least it's done in a pair. And the answer is usually the people are so mad, the accident not their fault, and they don't want to pay anything, and they just don't realize it. So that's something to consider if your car is in a... I would say, a, well, today's topic, brakes. I mean, if you're doing brakes, you don't just do new brakes on the left front wheel. Exactly. You want you want the car to stop straight. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it can it can change the handling characteristics of the car. And then the other thing too, I think a lot of people struts are just downright expensive. It's an expensive job. A lot of people try and cut corners and they don't replace the strut mount. Well, in my experience, half the time the strut mount is what's causing the noise and everything else. It's yeah. not the strut that's the problem, although the strut's worn out. So make sure when you're getting your quote for struts you're getting a quote with strut mounts in the whole package. Not It's back to Dave's question. Now how much to do the job the best way you can do it? Well, we talk about shocks and struts all the time. Do people know what the difference between shocks and struts are? I mean, a strut is like a shock, but it also uh, is a piece it, of the suspension, it, where the shock is just kind of along for the ride, and it's dampening the, the well, spring. The, the, shop is, the shock is just bolted up front or rear, and you could have a car with all four struts shocks and struts, like a combination front struts, It'll be rear a typical, shocks. typical Honda setup would be struts all the way around. Could be, or they could even have shocks in the rear. And and then the shot or the strut encompasses the spring and that's all held together and it's capped off with the mount. But so what's really cool now that Monroe has and KYB is starting to have them, strut assemblies. Your car's got 100,000 miles, 120,000 miles on it. You want to put struts on it? It's the whole deal. You're not putting out an old worn out spring. And by the time you give a little labor concession for not having to change all that over, right? that's the perfect way to do it. Strut kits that are, they call them quick struts. Well, when you're so, doing, a, when you're doing a, uh, replace shocks, you don't need alignment. When you're replacing struts, you absolutely need alignment. Well, uh, at the end of the show last week, right before the show closed, Matt said, why don't you practice what you preach? I had zero time to respond, but Matt actually crashed into my car. Uh, a week ago at Denny's, we were leaving our breakfast thing. We sat at breakfast for an hour and talked. He was walking out to the car. He said, oh, yeah, by the way, I hit your car <laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> well, It was like a senior moment. <laughs> you know, I got this new Toyota. And it's not new. I mean, it's, two, it's new, but it's two years old now. And, and I used to drive a lifted Chevy truck, and I could parallel park that thing, one hand, two-point turnaround, no big deal. I can't figure out where the corners are in that Toyota. And it, I think maybe Denny's has something to do with it. <laughs> I ordered him I, some curb feelers. <laughs> first time I pulled into that darn parking lot, the first day I had that darn truck, I hit the light pole. <laughs> so, 
But anyway, it was, but you didn't. You kind of brushed over that pretty quickly. <laughs> the point was is that you were texting at the stoplight, not texting, while driving. At least. Dec- texting a stoplight is okay. And eased in up, use. eased up a little bit, and did a little kiss the car in front of you with your no damage. <laughs> but real quick, there is a. We've actually got a our one one of few of our live Facebook questions during the show. So again, go to Facebook. Facebook and find Bumper to Bumper if you're a Facebooker or the Bumper to Bumper Radio dot com. Find the link for Facebook. But Mark Zitnik, I hope I pronounced that right if you're listening, Mark, says, Help, my daughter is melting, her car is blowing hot air, and all your partners on Bumper to Bumper are closed on Saturday. Well, I know for sure Dave Denman at Dave's Car Care is open. So if you're in the West Side, Mark, Dave Denman, 51st Avenue in Peoria. Kurtz is also open, 22nd Avenue in Bell. Desert Car Cares, Frank open. I think he might one, be open I think on one Saturday. of his locations is open on Saturday. So um, hopefully that helps you, Mark. Well, let's go with Chip in Mesa on a 2003 Hyundai. Go ahead, Chip. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thanks, guys. Uh, quick question. I uh, usually do a lot of errands in my car and uh, constantly starting and stopping it. And uh, sometimes it'll just, after a while, maybe about 45 minutes to an hour, starting and stopping it, it will just die on me. And um, sometimes I'll be at a light, and it'll just pop out on me. And as soon as I, if I give it gas, it'll go again. But uh, as soon as I let my foot off the gas, it stops, stops on me. Well, when you say stops, you mean the engine actually stalls, or the car just won't move? No, the engine actually stalls. When you say starting and stopping, is that turning the engine on and off? Yes. I don't know where they're starting and stopping <laughs> there is, Dave. But, okay, so you you start, you go into the store, you shut it off, you come back out, it starts right up. You go on your next little errand, maybe five or ten minutes, 15 minutes of driving, park, go in the store, come back out, and it starts up. Is that fairly accurate so far? Correct. And then maybe on your third or fourth trip, you're two hours into your little day of errands, and you're just driving along, maybe pull up to the stoplight, and it just shuts off for no reason. Yes. Does it restart? Um, it does, and then and as soon as I, I have to give a gas for it to restart, but as soon as I take my foot off the pedal, it stalls again. Any check engine light? No. No check engine light. Okay. Well, I'm going to – I mean, it's something that somebody needs to get checked out. So I, at first I'm thinking possibly a vacuum leak, but it's weird and odd that the check engine light won't come on or is not on because that, that – Usually leaves that's going to leave the footprint or leave the sign for the mechanic detective to go searching. I don't know. Do you get the feeling that the starting and stopping of the engine has anything to do with the fact that the car is dying? I think it's totally unrelated. If you would have had difficult, you know, extended cranking times in between mm-hmm. and not had an issue, that would maybe lean me towards a fuel pump or a, some kind of heat-related problem with a control module. But I'm thinking maybe a heavily carboned up throttle body. Maybe a mass airflow sensor that's a little dirty, that's not bad enough to cause a check engine light to come on, but it is either flooding, overfueling, or underfueling the engine. Um, it's it it's getting it needs to go to a shop. It needs to be checked out. And again, great resources at bumper to bumper radio dot com. Other than that, under the hood, there's not a whole lot you can check. Hey Chip, thanks so much for the call. I hope I'm pronouncing you right. Let's go with Nurit in Phoenix on a 1997 Toyota. Go ahead, Nurit. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, was driving along, and he he said he heard that my CVC joints might some wrong with the CVC joints and to replace them. I'm not quite sure what my CVC joints are you, and like how much it costs to get them replaced. And then he started mentioning about motor mounts as well. So you said he heard. Me, tell me exactly, you know, what direction to go in. You said he heard that your CV joints were bad. Was there a noise that he heard that turned well, he said you he into heard that? When I turned my steering wheel, ah. it was like a clack 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 noise. Yeah. And, and do you hear that also? So you make a sharp turn, like you're maybe you're pulling into a parking lot and accelerate a little bit into a space, and you little <laughs> like that? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, like that noise. <laughs> it's not very good. It's more like a clack, clack, clack noise. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a classic example of a, of a faulty CV joint. Yeah, and it's a good conversation for all of our listeners. In the front of your car, there's uh, if it's a front-wheel drive car, there's an axle that runs from the right side of the transmission to the right wheel in an axle that runs from the left side of the transmission to the left wheel. And there's joints, so it not only rotates, you know, 
uh, in a rotation motion. It also has to turn left or right. So there's four joints, two on each side. Two, two shafts. Each has a joint on the end. Each has a joint on the, the end. Outboard joints turn every time you turn the wheel. They rotate as fast as the car rotates, and as the suspension goes up and down, they're also moving up and down. Picture, you know, it's the old German guy playing the accordion or something. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, those, the, joints, the <laughs> those joints, those joints. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You've been drinking this morning? <laughs> yeah, this is Mountain Dew. <laughs> those uh, joints are protected by rubber boots, and those rubber boots are filled with grease. So if you're ever in the auto shop and they said, hey, your CV boots are torn, why well, they need to replace the, the boot or the joint or whatever it is, that's what they're talking about. So that boot tears, that boot's designed to keep grease in and dirt out. So when the boot tears, the grease comes out, and all the dirt and grime gets in, and eventually just wears that joint out. And when you get that noise, there's no just putting a new boot on it. It's time for a new axle. Well, and we, yeah, new axle. Or sometimes we used to just replace just the boot. But the cost of getting replacing just the boot is almost, if not just a little bit more, than just putting a whole brand new axle on. And now you've got a new axle, two new axle joints, and both boots are brand new. So that's yeah. something you might want to consider. In the old days, we just did boots, but the price of labor since then has doubled, and the price of the whole axle has come down. That's going so down. It's, it's more cost-effective just to do a whole new axle. And then a lot of other times that those axles need to re be replaced, we see a lot in Volkswagens and some Honda CRVs, you get a vibration on acceleration in about 70 mile an hour range, and the inboard joints are failing on those. So they not only need to be replaced at times for noise, for noise, but you can actually get a vibration symptom out of it. All right. The fact or fiction for today, if my brake fluid is low, topping it off will fix the problem. What do you think, Matt? Fact or fiction? That is fiction. Fiction? Yes. It's so the first time I've got a one word answer out of you. I was, I was really, I was going to go back to faction, you know, to my, it's, it's kind of right both ways. And typically the brake fluid is low and it's going to turn on the light and you just, ah, I got to get some brake fluid. So you have a buddy or a friend from the office or you stop at checker auto and the kid comes out and dumps some brake fluid in there. And yeah, they sh the brake fluid is going to get low once in a while. That's normal as long as it's not leaking. Right. But what does a low brake reservoir indicate, Dave? It indicates that the pads are wearing and the shoes are wearing, and they've worn to a point as they wear, more and more hydraulic fluid comes down into the system, and so it may be time for a brake yeah. job if it's getting real low. The calipers have to push out further, so you're, you picture you're extending out this hydraulic rod. Accordion. And this, <laughs> extending out this hydraulic piston, and as it goes out further, it takes more fluid to do that. It's drawing that fluid from the master cylinder. So... Don't run and go get a brake job right away. It's it's time to start thinking. If your car has 30,000 miles on it and the brake light comes on, fluid's low. Typical front brakes, 27 to 35,000 miles. But there's some anomaly. You know, these Chevy trucks go 100,000, and a lot of cars are really getting good mileage out of the brakes. So. Well, I heard you say the light comes on. What light comes on if the brake fluid is low? Red. Red parking Typically brake the red. light comes yeah, on. Yeah, it's the same, or brake, or brake warning light. So if you let the, take the, release a parking brake and that red light is still on, well, either there's a bad switch on that parking brake or the brake fluid is low. And speaking of two things, lights and parking brake. If you have an orange light for your ABS, it's not a good thing. It just means that the ABS system has, has been a, disabled. Has a failure and it has been disabled. You're not losing brakes. You're just reverting back to a conventional braking system. It's not something you want to ignore. It's something you get fixed, but it's not, you don't need to call the ambulance and get the car <laughs> in right away. But the other thing, you talked about the parking brake and maybe the light coming on. People don't understand the importance of using the parking brake. Using that parking brake, especially on a car that has rear drum brakes, will help keep that, the rear brakes adjusted. If the rear brakes are properly adjusted, they're going to be doing their job and doing their fair share of the work, and that will help the front brakes last longer. Well, let's go with Cindy in Glendale on a 1999 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Cindy. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, I, I have um, the service light came on. Took it, I took it into a shop that I've been going to for years. Um the, the code that came up was for the upstream, um, the two upstream O2 sensors, and they gave me a quote of $500, and I went to AutoZone, and I picked one up for $50, and I'm going to do the work myself, but I'm just kind of wondering, um, 
is it is it pretty common for it to be a five hundred dollar job as far as labor and parts? It, I would say yes. That is that is common, and I would I would probably be willing to bet that the fifty dollar oxygen sensor that you got at AutoZone is a universal, meaning it doesn't have the factory connector on you have to cut the old wires off and crimp them together to make that one work would be my guess at that price range uh-huh. um, and you don't want to do those you can never get those connections right i mean you're you're talking it's between m- a tenth of a volt and a volt it's very millivolts yeah, it's small low voltage but let's back this thing up even further it's very uncommon to have both oxygen sensors fail at the same time so and my, there, they haven't. Excuse me, they have not failed. At, one of them has completely failed. But he was uh, my the guy at the shop told me that um, the other one was on its way to fail. It was okay. It, it's going to fail soon. Do I you, guess is do what you, he meant. Do you know what the description of that code was, or what the code number was by chance? Zero one five four. P zero one five four. It's and that's one. Is it brings up a good conversation because it's it's very rare that uh, an O2 sensor, other than a heated O2 sensor shorted code, is actually an O2 sensor problem. So we see a lot of times people they go into uh, the, the, the local uh, Acme Auto Parts and they plug in and they pull up an O2 code, an O2 sensor code, and they immediately go sell them a fifty dollar O2 sensor. It's pretty quick to unscrew it, you know, unplug it, plug it back in. But unless it's a shorted code. It may not be an O2 sensor that's gone bad, and that's the first thing everyone does is throw an O2 sensor on it. But you can have a you can have a vacuum leak uh, causing an O2 sensor code. Yeah, but that P0154 code, that is not you know if it was a vacuum leak or a lean or rich condition, uh-huh. it would be like a P0174 depending on which bank of the engine on. The P0 P0154 or is more of a the function of the sensor like the heater oh, okay. circuit it's it it the code is actually that there's no activity from the oxygen sensor so, it's so bad. it could be dead and what and what the oxygen sensor is doing down there in the in the exhaust stream is it's just a it's you know like my when I was little I used to think there was a little monkey in the stoplight making the things go so there's a guy in the exhaust so to speak and he's sending a voltage signal going Hey, too much gas down here. Too much gas. And he, so he screams that to the computer, and the computer says, "Oh, pull back." Oh, two man down there saying too much fuel. Take it back. And now all of a sudden he gets a whiff of the exhaust again. No, 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 not enough. Give me more. And this is happening hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a second, a minute, whatever. I mean, it, it's rapid. So what that code that you have is just the computer seeing nothing from the oxygen sensor. Probably a pretty good bet. That's what it is. But I will tell you this, take the $50 oxygen sensor back and get the most expensive one. <laughs> and I'm not saying that because I want you to spend more money. I'm saying that because I want you to get a quality Good. part. There's different lengths of wire on them, too. Mm-hmm. You can get the, you know, you want to get the one that fits exactly as far as the wiring and connector goes. And otherwise, it is a repair that most people can perform themselves if they're relatively handy. And your typical auto parts store, I mean, a good, a good brand is Bosch. NTN makes a good one, which is part of NGK. Um, so get a good one. Get one that is not a universal fit. Get one that has the right connectors on it so you can plug it right in. And it shouldn't be too terribly hard to do. Thanks so much for the call, Cindy. We got a break question from Tom in Mesa on a 2004 F-350. Go ahead, Tom. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thank you for taking my call, for one. Uh, the second, I love this truck. Uh, it's just great. I'm going to keep it for quite some time. And um, I noticed about a year ago that when I'm pulling up to a light, or slowing down, it pulsates. And my question is, um, I think the brakes are still good in the front. I've inspected them, but should I get the rotors replaced or milled to to rid that uh, pulsating sensation? Well, how many miles are on the truck, first of all? 90. 90,000. And has it ever had brakes before? As far as I know, no. Okay. It has not. Now, when you say it pulsates, is it like... Going down the freeway 55 miles an hour and you start to decelerate, put your foot on the brake to exit ramp and you get a shake in the steering wheel? Or is it a lower, seat, lower speed seat of your pants, you feel it in your butt kind of vibration? Uh, it, it's when I'm pulling up to a stop and the, you can feel the whole truck pulsate as you are coming to a stop. Kind of like a surge maybe? like a, Yeah, uh, it's, it's, you can, it's almost like you can feel the unevenness in the rotor. 
If you envision it in your head. Yeah. Well, you know, you can, not in the pedal, but the whole truck. Okay. And this truck has rear disc brakes, I'm assuming, as well. It does. Okay. So really what you need to do is get into a shop, and a bumper-to-bumper -bumper radio shop would be a, a, a good place to start if you don't have one. And then you're going to want to have them do a full brake inspection. They're going to check all the linings, the thickness of the brake pads. They're going to measure the thickness of the rotors, and that's where it's important. They're also going to measure the run out, how much, you know, picture an old record player with a with the needle going up and down. That's where you get your vibration from when those calipers clamp down. And and you only, and, the, and once the rotors and all that stuff is measured, then you'll know if you can just machine the rotors or if you can or if you should replace them. Sometimes sometimes I would prefer machining the factory rotor versus maybe a cheap aftermarket. Yeah, you don't rotor. want a cheap one, but and the other thing is we've been talking about using an on the car brake lathe. That is the best way to get the get the rotor machined and true to the hub of the car so that's one thing to ask your shop